Hi friends, one of my absolute favorite items in my art kit is my fan brush. You could say I'm a big fan of this wonderful and versatile little tool. I use it when I'm painting hair, fur, clumpy earth, leaves, and foliage, ripples in water, tree bark, and well just about any texture you can imagine. In this video, I highlight a number of ways in which you can maximize use of the fan brush by varying the method in which you hold it in relation to your paper. Pivot, stroke, splatter, and stipple your way to incredible texture, friends. Whether you're a plein air painter or a studio artist, I hope these tips will help you to create more natural results. These mini lessons are excerpts from my full two-hour tutorial, Painting Fields and Grasses in Watercolor, which is filmed at a regular speed and is much more in-depth. This video also comes with a reference kit, downloadable file, and images, and a glossary of terms, as well as a full materials list. Check the description below for a link. For these exercises, I recommend using a synthetic fan brush. This is important as some of the techniques involve masking fluid, and masking fluid really adheres to and can ruin your natural hair bristles. I'm using my ivory fling from my line of paintbrushes, and it's a smooth synthetic bristle that's really rigid and firm. Most importantly, the bristles stay beautifully splayed, which is the key to achieving excellent texture. We're going to be using masking fluid. I'm using my Pebio drawing gum. And to protect your brushes, you're going to want to have a little bit of soap um, to protect your bristles from the masking fluid. And I'm just using uh, the master's brush cleaner, but you can use any hard bar soap. You're going to want a test strip of paper, a nice pad of paper towel or a rag, and you may even want to have some Kleenex or tissue on hand. Of course, you're going to want a big, beautiful palette that has lots of mixing space for the various color recipes we're going to be creating. Be sure to check out my color recipes chart if you are uncomfortable with color mixing. This is a great tool for you because it kind of demystifies all of my favorite color recipes and gives you endless combinations of colors. You'll find it all in my color chart recipes bundle. Watercolor paper comes in 22 inch by 30 inch formats and I just cut mine into quarters so that yields roughly an 11 inch by 15 inch sheet. I'm going to be working on 140 pound cold pressed paper so it's got a delightful texture to it and that's going to help us greatly in creating these wonderful and expressive textures that we're looking for here. So we're going to look at this farm scene here and we're going to just focus on the foreground below the fence line. So as you can see, there's multiple kind of waves or rifts in the grasses. And I want you to start looking at fields and meadows as if they were almost like an ocean scene or a seascape where you could see defined ripples in the grasses. And I think this is a really important factor in recreating that sort of depth in your own paintings. When you're able to kind of pick out contour lines and mounds or segments of grass, then you can start creating a little bit more perspective. I like to think of the field as being divided into thirds, where most of the activity in the lower portion of the frame belongs to the foreground and through the middle of the field that belongs to the middle ground and in the back strip that belongs to the background. So foreground, middle ground, background. Notice that when I do the grasses my brush is flipped around like so and that ensures that when I apply the strokes that they naturally taper as I lift off the paper. So I start at the base of the grasses and I pull upward. And in the lower level grasses, that bottom third, these are the grasses that are closest to us. 
And notice that I'm pivoting my brush and creating some interesting angles. As we move through the middle layer, I can do the same thing, but these strokes are going to be a little shorter. And again, still working from the bottom up using a light touch. So this is the same technique that I use both for my masking fluid and then to actually paint the grasses themselves. When we get to the upper third portion of the field, I can apply a few little grasses here, but once again, they're gonna be so short and in subsequent layers, I might even just consider tapping for texture. Just to say, oh, there's a little, there's some changes and some kind of rifts and waves in the field, but it's so far away, we can't really even see the grasses themselves. So that's how you build perspective through layering texture. Again, we do this both with the paint and with the masking fluid. And it's really easy to see how effective this is in creating some perspective and some depth. That's if we're moving from the foreground and we're down low with the longer grasses, and then we kind of creep back through the middle ground with middle length grasses, and then finally really compressed, elongated lines and waves for the background. Very simple and effective way to create perspective in your fields. So we're gonna start with a wash, and I'm just gonna use my one inch wash brush. I'm gonna pre-wet this space, and we're just gonna take it all the way up. So we're just eliminating that farm altogether and really just focusing on the grasses here. So once that's wet, I'm gonna put down a light kind of neutral green. And for us, for these purposes, I'm just gonna use sap green. And then I'm going to bring in a little bit of gamboge. This is just our first wash. And of course, depending on your field, you're gonna have different combinations of greens. But for now, we're just kind of focusing on a simple palette. So here comes the gamboge, and I'm just gonna keep that brighter, warmer color in the foreground. So we're actually going to just let this totally dry. A really important tip here is to make sure that you do not overload your brush with masking fluid. If I put too much masking fluid on my brush, I'm going to end up with big blocky blobs of um, well, masking fluid, <laughs> and that doesn't look like grass at all. So the key here is to just lightly mask, and if you have too much on your brush, just wipe the excess off, use a light hand, and a brisk brush stroke. That's what's going to give you those fine grasses with the tapered tip. And you can try using masking fluid pens or um, other tools, but I find the fan brush is a really great way to work quickly and efficiently because you're laying down multiple strokes instead of just one little blade at a time. Certainly, if you have areas of grass that require a few really specific elegant strokes, you can use your rigger or your liner. Again, make sure it's synthetic. And then you can kind of, after you've masked larger groups of grasses with your um, fan brush, you can go and just pick out a few really lovely and much more specific shapes with your rigger or liner. I want to make sure it's 100% dry because the next thing we're going to be doing is actually applying some masking fluid. For this, you're going to need masking fluid. I use the Pebeo drawing gum and you're going to want some hard soap, like a bar of soap or as you can see here, I'm using my master's brush cleaner, but any hard soap will do, and that's just to protect the bristles. So I wanna wet my fan brush, and then I soap the fan brush, and then I wipe that extra soap off, 
and I'm ready to dip into my masking fluid. Whatever masking fluid brush you're using, you want to make sure that it's synthetic. I'm using my ivory fling here. You can see that the bristles remain really splayed beautifully and I won't ever have to struggle to kind of break them up. Now with the grass, it's really important that we make sure that we're kind of changing direction and that the strokes are interesting. This is pretty much how your masking fluid should look on top of the green base before you move on to the next layer. It's important not to overdo the masking fluid here. If you're a little heavy handed, you'll end up with very blocky clumps and that's not something that we're looking for here. We want fine lines. If you do end up with clumps of grass, you can just take your finger once the masking fluid is dry and then just rub off the sections that didn't work out for you. So now it's time to actually apply more paint. I've washed the masking fluid off of my brush and I'm ready to move into slightly darker values. For this, I'm just going to apply to the surface of the paper for now and then while these strokes are wet, I'm going to drop in some other colors. So you can see we're staying with that same formula, working the fan brush very lightly in just like light brisk strokes from the base up, making sure that I'm not being too mathematical, my strokes aren't too symmetrical, they're nice and wild and uneven. Moving to the middle ground, shorter strokes. If you can see your masking fluid, then just follow that pattern, but you don't have to stick with it exactly. So before that dries, I actually want to go into my burnt umber and get a little bit of violet mixed up in there. And I'm going to apply some earthier tones to the bases of the um, middle grasses just for this particular feel. Actually, I'm going to throw some in here to the base of my foreground grass as well. That just kind of suggests a little bit of an earthy kind of quality. Go back to my sap green. Before that dries, I'm just going to introduce some Hooker's Green Dark. I don't have to worry too, too much about the texture here, although I do want it looking grassy. Um, we do have quite a lot of texture that we've created from the previous layer or in the previous layer with the masking fluid. In this foreground layer, I can actually introduce a little bit more of that yellow, keeping in mind that warm colors come forward and cool colors recede, so a little bit more of a warmer tone in the foreground. And I'm working with the Hooker's Green Dark again. And then finally, we're getting to that section where I'm just sort of tapping some grasses until in this section, it just fades away. I'm gonna bring a little bit of ultramarine blue in with some Hooker's Green Dark, just to create slightly bluer, softer fields. And I'm just gonna wash that out with a bit of water. It just depends on how much focus you wanna to bring to that area. The wetter the paper, the softer the focus. back a little bit more uh, value here so I'm just tapping a little suggested line. I think I can rev up the value making it a little bit darker in the middle here so I'm going back to the burnt umber violet and I think I'm actually just going to add a little bit of hooker's green dark just to make things a bit more interesting some bigger changes more shifts in value. You don't want to build too, too much up here or it will all just turn into one value and one color. So I think that that is plenty. 
If you feel like just kind of finishing off the seam just to make it feel like you've got a bit of closure, you can imagine a little tree line perhaps back here. So we could say, I've got a little bit of ultramarine and hooker's green dark on my brush here, just using a number six round, just kind of quickly dry brushing in a bit of a, an expressive tree line. And I'm going to drop a little bit of violet in there. Now that this has had a chance to dry, we can remove the masking fluid. And once again, this piece has quite a lot of masking fluid on it, so rather than use my fingers, I'm going to use my rubber cement pickup. Make sure you get rid of all that residual gummy stuff from previous exercises. Also ensure that it doesn't streak on your painting by just checking it out on a blank sheet of watercolor paper first. So you can see some of the extra texture that was created from the masking fluid starting to really show up beautifully. So I just feel around, make sure that I've gotten all the masking fluid. And honestly, that looks pretty swell, I would say. If you wanted, if the masking fluid has gotten a little chunky in some areas, you certainly can go back on a dry surface and with paint, whatever paint color you wanna use depending on the area that you're working in, with paint you can actually just go and kind of re-split those areas by adding a few extra paint brush strokes in there. Voila, really simple texture in about three layers. And just to reiterate, it's so important to have a brush whose bristles stay splayed while you're working with them. So my synthetic fling is available on my website under my shop brushes section, and it is absolutely my favorite brush of all time. It's a little workhorse that works beautifully with paint as well as masking fluid. Once this is dry, if you desire a little bit more texture in this lower third portion, we can actually put a little bit of masking fluid uh, with our fan brush in a kind of tapping motion. We don't have long grasses to contend with here, so. I recommend just using that tapping, maybe some short bristly strokes, maybe even some lines, but not, we won't be doing really long grassy strokes. So once again, I wet my brush with water, I soap my bristles, I wipe the excess soap off, and now my bristles are nice and protected against the masking fluid. I dip into my masking fluid and I take all of the excess off, so I just have a thin layer. And I'm going to follow the pattern that we established earlier. So it's sort of flatter through this section and a bit more lively through here. I don't want polka dots here, so I do have to kind of make sure that I'm not creating an inadvertent pattern. Rinse, rinse, rinse. Re-soap and back into the masking fluid. And here I think I will do just some lines. I'm gonna start at this end and move upward. So you can see I'm starting on the tape so that the lines are thicker here and then when I move up into the distance, I lift my brush so that it fades out. I'm gonna do a little bit of splattering here for some texture. 
I've got masking fluid on my bristles and I'm just flicking downward against a thin handle. I think that's plenty of masking fluid for this particular exercise. So as you probably have figured out by now, every time we mask, we have to let that completely dry before we move on to the next painted layer. And uh, we're ready to do so. Now, this is a particularly subtle variation of um, color in this field. So we're not gonna go too crazy here, but I do want a little bit more texture with paint and I do want a little bit more range of color. So I'm gonna work on dry, but then um, here and there when I need to quickly soften up some lines, I'm just going to kind of scribble some water over top. I'm going back to that sap green. And I'm gonna start my strokes at the bottom. And you can see the texture of the paper is kind of doing all the work for us. So getting a little bit of a dry brush. Notice that my brush is sort of, I'm laying it down like a paddle. If I want finer lines, I can use the tip, but here I'm just sort of dragging it across. And I'm gonna do a few lines back here. Definitely want to get a little bit more of an earthy tone. So I'm going to mix my Burnt Umber and Hooker's Green Dark together in my palette. And now I'm just applying it in little dashes here. So once again, we're looking at creating a range of color and value. This is, albeit a very subtle variation, but the texture and the system is kind of the same. The section that's closest to us is more in focus, and as we move to the background, it gets lighter and softer. Back to my sap green here. I think I, whoops, I don't want actual strokes. I just want, just a bad habit. I just want to create um, a little bit more range and value here. Hooker's green dark. That's plenty. So we can remove the masking fluid now and see what we're left with. So once again, I'm using my rubber cement pickup. And that little bit of masking fluid that we applied, it wasn't very much, but I think it just does a nice job at creating a little bit of added interest to the foreground. It makes it feel a little grittier. We can go back in with the fan brush. If there are too big of um, gaps in here, we can just kind of fill them in a little bit. You could do that with a bit of splatter if you want to, or some dry brushing like what I'm doing here. I'm just taking my sap green and going over. So we're working on dry and all I want to do is take my fan brush and I'm using it almost like a paddle on its side and I'm skimming across the surface with some sap green. I'm letting some of that underpainting show through. If it's too much, I can dilute it with a bit of water. And I want to make sure that the brush strokes become increasingly larger as we move down to the bottom of the paper. In the middle to background, in addition to becoming cooler and lighter, our strokes should also become a little finer. So to the point where I'm actually just using the tips of the bristles here and just dotting waves and rifts in the field. Whereas in the foreground, I can definitely be more gestural and create larger strokes. I'm going to add a little bit of raw sienna. The paper's sort of damp here. 
So that means beautiful blooms might form, and that's a good thing, I love that. I'm gonna take a bit of the Hooker's Green Dark now. If I want it to look a bit more grassy, I'll use upward strokes, but really this is either a potato field or soy or something, so it's quite rounded and chunky looking. But we're getting, um, we're beginning to get a really nice contrast between the foreground, middle ground, and background, and that's exactly what we want. I think I'm actually going to bring in some gamboge just to really brighten things up. Again, working in kind of a damp surface, so it's splitting open some of the uh, paint that I've just put down and creating kind of a bloom, which is beautiful. You can check out my YouTube channel. There's a little video all about blooms, so if you're not sure how or why they form, there's a good tutorial on there. I'm gonna grab a little bit of burnt sienna and just add that, just so that we don't have too much of this monotonous green. That will help to break things up a bit. Even putting a bit of violet in here. The violet and the green end up kind of making a murky brown, which is quite nice. Different than Murphy Brown, if you remember that TV show. A murky brown, a sort of a muddy color. I'm now going to splatter some masking fluid. So I'm going back to my ivory fling. I'm gonna wet my brush, I'm soaping it, wiping that extra soap off. I've still got enough on there to protect my bristles. Dipping into the masking fluid. And this time we, we want a fair amount on the bristles. I'm gonna go to a skinny handle and I'm going to splatter. Now, rather than splattering uh, perpendicular to the handle, I'm gonna splatter parallel. And that just gives me bigger blobs. If you want really big blobs, you can just sort of flick your brush down like this, but I think I already have enough on here. Rinse, rinse, rinse. I have a lot of yellow as a foundational color underneath all of these greens, including the flowers and foliage. So we're going to be painting that first and then working some masking fluid over top with our fan brush. Okay, so this is dried now and I'm going to be going in and um, I'll be splattering masking fluid to preserve the yellows and I'll also be hand painting some of the masking fluid to preserve the larger blobs and flower heads. Okay, going back to splattering with my masking fluid just to protect some of the uh, finer yellow flowers. That should do it. Now this looks like a ton of masking fluid on here, but in my experience you can never really have too much. So I'm just going to slap on a few grasses while I'm here. Before that dries, I want to bring in the Hooker's Green Dark, but it's now mixed with a little bit of violet, so that creates a nice dark deep, almost like a pine green. The darker we go, the brighter the flowers will look. So those flowers are really going to pop 
against any dark patches. So that's important information. If you don't have enough contrast, the flowers just aren't going to pop forward. So still looking at patches and waves. Before this dries, I'd actually like to get a little bit of alizarin crimson into the grasses. So I'm using my fan brush, using our um, just the tips of the brush, starting at the bottom and stroking upward. And of course, red and yellow make orange, so we don't even need to apply orange here. The red and the yellow mixing together are just naturally going to do that. I don't want too much of that in this particular scene, but it also makes kind of a brownish tone, which makes the greens a little bit more natural. And before this dries, I'm gonna take a little bit of raw sienna and burnt sienna mixed together, and we're just gonna do a little bit of splattering here. And then I'm gonna apply some blurry strokes to this background. I'm really loving how the burnt sienna and the yellows are working together here. It just creates a very supportive kind of amber glow around the edges of the um, metal flowers. So I'm going to go to the Hofer's Green Dark and Violet. And making sure I'm brushing from the bottom up and making sure my bristles are staying nice and splayed. Time to remove the masking fluid. And I'm just doing that with my rubber cement pickup. You want to make sure that you remove all that extra gummy stuff if you've got a buildup. Ooh, here come the white flowers. And a few yellow flowers as well. And some of the whites were preserved for the purple thistles as well. Looking good. All right, so I just feel around. I've got a little bit more through here. I seem to have gotten it all. The last step is to fill in any white areas and you can also intensify the greens, grasses, and differentiate some of the foliage. Just a reminder that this is just a short snippet of the full two hour video painting fields and grasses and watercolor available on my website. For the complete list of art tutorials that I have available, visit my website, www.crystalbeshera.com slash shop videos, or you can check out the vimeo.com slash channels slash art tutorials website. Thanks for watching everybody and happy painting as always. See you the next time.